Okay, hello everyone. Today we're gonna to be going over advanced counting. So, overview of counting. So first let's review some basic counting principles. So factorials and permutations. Permutations are the number of ways to order objects so that the order matters. For example, in seating arrangements, lineups, etc. If you're given X items and Y spaces to put them in where the order matters, the number of ways to order them is x factorial divided by y factorial. Factorials and combinations. Combinations are the number of ways to order objects so that the order doesn't matter. For example, people in a team or group, ways to collect stuff, etc. If you're given x items and y available spaces where the order does not matter, the number of ways to order them is x factorial divided by y factorial multiplied by x minus y factorial. This is because it's the same as a permutation, but the order doesn't matter, so we're dividing by the number of repetitions that exist. So, overview of counting problem number one. So, the first question. There are cards in a deck numbered from 0 to 10. How many cards are there in this deck? And you can, like, pause this video. If we, if we presented a question to you, you can always pause the video and try to do it on yourself, by yourself, and then resume the video once you've gotten the answer. And the answer for this question um, is 11 cards because we have to include the zeroth card. So there'd be the cards one to 10 and then plus one, so that'd be 11. Okay. Overview counting problem two. How many squares and or rectangles are in this picture? How many squares and rectangles are in this picture? And the answer to that is 18. And the reason for this is because first you have the, um, first let's look at the middle square. That's like the small center square. In that square, you would have a square in the top left, the top right, the bottom left, and the bottom right. And then you would also have, that would be four squares. And then you would also have a rectangle that's like the top half of the square, a rectangle that's the bottom half of that square, a rectangle that's the left half of that square, and a rectangle that's the right half of that square. So, so far we've got four squares and four rectangles. Finally, we just need to count that center square itself and that'd be nine squares for that, just that center square. Now, if you notice this, the big square that's um, containing everything is actually identical to that middle square. So since we've already counted that there are nine squares and rectangles in the center square, we just, gotta we had to, we just have to multiply that by two to get 18 total squares and rectangles. Overview of counting problem three. So there are 10 cards labeled from one to 10. How many ways are there to randomly choose two different cards from the deck, given that the order of the cards does not matter? And the answer to this problem would be 45. There are 10 cards and we need to choose two of them. Because order does not matter, we're just doing a combination, 10 choose two. 10 choose 2 would be 10 times 9 divided by 2 times 1, and that is 45 ways to choose two cards. Okay, so advanced counting. So topics to be covered today. So we're going to be covering um, of, of some common um, types of counting problems. We're going to be covering table problems and bracelet problems and the differences and the difference between those two. We're also going to be covering how to count um, the number of factors, uh, st strategies to count the number of factors in a number and, the, and strategies to count the number of perfect factors. We're also going to be introducing complementary counting and how to count paths in a grid. Okay, so setting around a table. There are six people at a meeting. How many different ways can they be seated around a circular table? Remember to pause this video, so. 
Okay, so the answer is that is 120. So there are six people, A, B, C, D, E, and F, sitting around this table, right? And the first person has six places to choose where to sit, right? The second person has five, the next person has four, etc., right? But for each orientation of the table, you can rotate it to form five other orientations, which would be considered the same because they are in the same order. They're just moved. So what we do is we divide by six because you're adding that five other orientations to that one original orientation. And that would mean that there's six times the number of actual orientations, which um, you could be sit seated around a table in with six other with six people. So you just divide by six and you do 720 divided by six, which is equal to 120. Now, the next problem is about arranging beats on a bracelet. So Molly is about to string six beads onto a bracelet, which will then be closed after she finishes. How many distinct ways can the beads be ordered on the bracelet? And this problem is pretty similar to the table problem, except there is one catch. As usual, you have six objects, which we're gonna call A, B, C, D, E, and F, which means that our, there are six slots on the bracelet that these beads can occupy. And again, just like the previous question, we do six times five times four times three times two times one equals 720, and then we divide by six to compensate for the um, rotation. So that would be 120. However, um, in this question, the, the bracelet can also be flipped to create another orientation, which technically is the same as its counterpart. Therefore, we overcount it again. And in order to compensate for the um, flipped orientation, we have to divide by two because there's the original orientation and it's flipped orientation, which should be the same. So we do 120 divided by two. So in total, there are 60, um, ways Molly can string the be beads onto her bracelet. Okay, so if you're setting things around a table, um, you have to be um, aware of accidentally overcounting rotations of um, yeah, or rotations. But if you're like, if there's a question asking you about like stringing beads on a bracelet, you might accidentally count both rotations and reflections. So whenever you get like a problem that's like talking about arranging things around a circle, you have to think to yourself, is it possible to rotate this object or flip this object? Like, so for like a table, you can rotate your seating arrangement, but you can't like flip the table and like, sit on the upside down. But then for like bracelets, um, you can flip the bracelet after you've like created an orientation. So you need to compensate for these by dividing by the number of spaces it can be rotated or dividing by two if it can be flipped. Yeah, and to add on, sometimes they give like square tables. Like remember that you can um, rotate this table too. It doesn't just have to be circular for it to be able to be rotated or um, reflected to get the same um, actual combination. Okay. So how many divisors does 45 have? Remember to pause this video. And do it. Okay. So firstly, don't list out all the factors. So first let's factor, let's find the prime factorization of 45. So we have 45 is equal to nine times five, which is equal to three times three times five, which is equal to three squared times five to the power of one. So, so now we take the exponents, which are two and one in this case, and we add one to each of these exponents. So we have three and two, and then we multiply them together to get three times two, which is equal to six. So that's six is the number of factors 45 has. You can list them out right now and check. Okay, 
So counting factors. So for this question, why does this work? So the prime factorization just breaks a number into its parts. So all the possible factors of a number are made of one of those prime factors. In 45's case, we have 3 squared times 5 to the power of 1. And that means that um, and any factor of 45 can have a combination of 3 to the power of 0, 1, or 2 as its factor, and any number 5, so 5 to the power of 0 or 5 to the power of 1. Um, so basically, that means there are three ways to get a 3 to the power of something, and there are, five way, or there are two ways to get 5 to the power of something. So you just multiply 3 times 2, because you can have 3 times... 3 to the power of 0 times 5 to the power of 0, 3 to the power of 0 times 5 to the power of 1, 3 to the power of 1 times 5 to the power of 0, 3 to the power of 1 times 5 to the power of 1, 3 to the power of 2 times 5 to the power of 0, or 3 to the power of 2 times 5 to the power of 1. So that was our six option. So that's why it works. Okay, so, so now we're going to take the strategy and apply it to um, counting perfect square factors. So this question is, how many perfect square divisors or factors does 246,960 have? And again, you can pause this video, to find the prime factorization, and try to apply the strategy we just learned. So the answer um, would be, well, the answer is um, a big number. It's, well, it's, it's not very big, actually. Although, to, okay, the, the number 246,960 has a pretty long prime factorization. It, has, it is 2 to the 4th times 3 squared times 5 times 7 cubed. And so, obviously, this has a lot of um, normal factors, like regular factors. But we're just looking for the perfect square factors. So, and we can actually modify our strategy to and apply it in a certain way. So first, we take the, this prime factorization and we're gonna group up all the even powers, which um, I've written in red here. And why are we doing the even powers? It's because the e in order for a number to be a perfect square, all the numbers in its prime factorization must have even powers because you can't have like an odd power. Um, so what I've done here, I've taken it, I've pulled out all the even powers. So we, so the prime factorization is now two to the fourth times three squared times seven squared. Those are the even powers. And then times five times seven. This is the exact same as the previous prime factorization, but I've just grouped together all the even powers. So next, what we do is we drop the leftover odd powers because they're not going to help us form perfect squares. So now we're left with only the perfect square powers. And now, and we're going to modify it. So the factorization, which isn't going to be prime anymore, is going to be um, the perfect square factorization. So 2 to the fourth um, is equal to 4 squared. So we're going to write 4 squared instead of 2 to the fourth. And 3 squared is the same thing as 9 to the first. So we're going to write 9 instead of 3 squared. And 7 squared is the same as 49 to the first. And we're, so we're going to write 49. So now um, what we've done is we've turned it into 4 squared times 9 to the first times 49 to the first. We're left only with the perfect squares. And this isn't a prime factorization. And it doesn't equal our original number. But these, this is all of the, um, from this we can count all the perfect square factors that this number has. So we take each of the, so now we can apply our previous strategy. We take all the exponents, we add one to each one, and then we multiply them together. So that would be um, two plus one times one plus one times one plus one, that's three times two times two. So it's 12 perfect square factors. And it's a lot, it may be a lot less than you expect considering that um, the original number was so large, but that's because um, the number of perfect square factors is dependent on how many even factors this number has. Okay, so now we have complementary counting. So our question is how many ways are there to flip four coins so that there are at least two heads? So, sorry, pause the video and 
Let's try to solve it. Okay, so we use complementary counting. So basically what complementary counting is, is finding the number of ways that you can't fit the case that you're given and subtracting that from the total number of cases. So in this scenario, they're asking for two heads. So the opposite of that would be no heads and one. So there is one way for us to flip four coins so that there are no heads. So you would have four tails. And there is there are four ways to flip coins so that there's only one head. So you would have heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, tails, heads, heads, tails, heads, 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 heads tails. So what you do now is you, you find the total number of cases, which is two times two times two times two, because there's two ways to flip a coin. So you can have a head or a tail, and you're doing that four times. So you have two times two times two times two, which is equal to 16 total ways to flip four coins. So now what you do is you subtract four and one from 16, because we're using complementary counting, where we're subtracting the number of ways to not fulfill the um, conditions you're given. So 16 minus 4 minus 1 is equal to 9. So there are nine ways to flip four coins so that there are at least two heads. Okay, counting pass. So how many, if you are only allowed to travel up and right along these grid lines, how many paths are there from A to B? And so here's the solution. Um, let's, ju let's just say that each um, line segment is going to, each like side of one of those small squares is going to be like considered a like mini path or like one unit. So if we, any path from point A to point B must, be, must consist of three up paths and four right paths. And I'm going to use the letter U to denote up and the letter R to denote right. And th this property applies no matter no matter what type of path you use. Um, so there, no matter what type of path you take from A to B, as long as you're going only up and right, you must have three up paths and four right paths. And the, these um, can come go in any any order. So, for example, R R R R U U U is a legal path, and so is R U R R U U R. So. Now we can sort of like restate the question. How many ways are we tr are there to arrange three U's, three like letter U's and four letter R's in a row? So to do this, um, we're, we're basically now just arranging letters in a word. You have seven slots for the seven letters and you need to choose three of the slots for the U's, which is, so now, now you're in, so that would be seven choose three or seven times six times five divided by three times two times one that's 35 so the answer is there are 35 ways you can take a path from point a to point b and um note that um you can also do seven choose four because of the property that um seven choose three is or a choose B is the same as A choose A minus B. So you can do seven choose three or seven choose four for this, but you get the same answer. Okay. So paths with holes. So if you are allowed to travel only up and right along these lines, how many paths are there from A to B? So think about how to solve this. Do you guys have any ideas on a strategy to use? Make sure to pause this and see if you think you know how to solve this. Okay. So, strategy for counting paths with holes. So, here's a strategy to use. The strategy involves numbering the vertices based off of how many paths there are to it. So, what you do is you number the horizontal line with ones and you number the vertical line with ones. So the leftmost and the bottommost lines, you number it with ones because there is only one way to get there. You have to go directly up to get to any of those ones that are the leftmost side, are on the leftmost side. 
to get to any of those vertices. And you have only one way to travel on the bottommost line to get to any of those vertices. So now what you do is you add up the, the number that is to the left of a verte vertex and the number that's to the bottom of a vertex. So for this, um, for this vertice labeled two, we're just adding the one that's to the left of it and the one that's to the bottom of it. So we do this going up, so we have three and four, and then we do this going um, right, and we get two, three, four, and five. So now what we do is we have to add the three and the three to get to that vertice labeled six. And then we do six plus four, and we get 10 for the vertice, which is labeled 10. And then we just write four all the way. We write four for the um, vertex that has um, no path going from the left to it because we're just adding the number of ways to get to it from the left, which is zero, and the number of ways to get to it from the bottom, which is four. And then we add four and 10 and we get 14, and then we add four and five, get nine, and then we add nine and 14 to get to our final answer of 25 or 23, sorry. It will it go back. Um, I want to point out something that um, if you, you may like see a similarity between this and Pascal's triangle, because this basically is Pascal's triangle. It's just on a square grid instead of a triangle, because in Pascal's triangle, you're adding the numbers that are you're adding the two numbers that are above the element. But in this case, we're adding the two numbers that are to the left and below it. So if you notice there's a pattern, um, well, it's because it's similar to Pascal's triangle. Um, also, remember that if you're having trouble with like normal grids, like even if they don't have holes, you can still use this strategy and it will work because it's using the same logic as counting paths normally. So, yeah. Okay, and for a final question, I think, um, your grandmother has 10 candies, which she wants to distribute between her four grandchildren. How many ways are there for her to do this? So again, pause this video, see if you can figure out how to do this. Okay, so um, here's a quick visual. So we're gonna just call her grandchildren, grandchildren Alex, Ben, Carrie, and Donna, or just A, B, C, D. And the purple circles are going to be the 10 candies, and she has four grandchildren. So um, let's, um, so we're going to sort of like restate the question. We're basically trying to divide 10 identical objects into four distinct groups. So yeah. And so, but instead of creating, um, four groups. We can also create the four groups by using three vertical lines to divide the candies into four groups. So as you can see here, the leftmost group is going to be Alex's portion. Um, the second to leftmost group is going to be Ben's portion. Um, the second to right group is going to be Carrie's portion and the rightmost group is going to be Donna's portion. So in this way, um, these three vertical lines are, are totally identical, but no matter where you put the three lines, there's always going to be four groups. And sometimes the groups may not have anything in them, but there's still going to be four groups. So now, we've re now we can restate this question again. Um, now we're basically, um, we have 10. Okay, so we're trying to figure out how many ways we can arrange 13 objects, we're, gonna, we're trying to find how many ways are there we can place three lines among 10 other objects. So basically now, now what we can do is we have 13 objects, we have three lines, we need to find the way, number of um, places to put the three lines. So for that we would do 13 choose three, there's 13 total objects, there are three lines, 13 choose three, or 13 choose 10 because we have 13 total objects and we can choose 10 spots too. That'd be the same thing. 13 choose three um, is 858. So that in total, there are 858 on um, your grandma could distribute the candies. And you can see here that what we've done, we've sort of like simplified the question. Um, 
if you were to just take the question the way it was and try to f figure it out, you would find yourself listing out a lot of cases. But by rearranging the question and simplifying it, we can turn it into something that we can use what we've learned. Um, also, not that if it's given that you have to have a minimum of one thing inside or in between these two these lines, right? You just do the number of objects, which would be like 10 candies here. If the question asks like how many ways can you give 10 candies to three children, to four children where everyone gets at least one, you do, you just do 10, choose three because um, here you have to have one object um, per child. So that would mean that you're only using the spaces in between the kids um, and yeah. Okay, so today we went over some common types of counting problems and we showed you some strategies for how to solve them. So um, if you don't understand anything in this video, you can always like rewind and go back or you can um, ask us for help. So if, if you have any questions, um, since we're not in person, right? Since we're not um, in a live meeting, you can always send us an email or schedule office hours and we'll try to answer them. So yeah. Stay tuned for a quiz on Google Classroom too. It's gonna to be posted on Friday or Saturday. So yeah, um, bye everyone. Make sure you take that quiz and also make sure you take the quiz for this week um, before uh, the test is put out. Bye.